Hello everybody and welcome back once again to the Biff Rugby League podcast. This is episode two of the first series. Uh, my name is Bradley and I'm once again joined by Robin and Toby. Together we'll bring you a slightly different look at the world of rugby league and give you the ins and outs of this week's events. Uh, particularly this week we're going to look at the Challenge Cup first round. We'll go through the England women's national performance squad just before the World Cup at the end of the season. And we'll, have, we'll give you our player of the round from the Challenge Cup as well, as well as, as always, our set of six. And this week, Toby's going to induct someone into the Biff Rugby League Hall of Fame, which means it's my turn next week. So I've got to get my thinking cap on. Um, before we go into the ins and outs of this week and everyone sort of what they want to talk about, how, how have you two been? Did you get yourself to a Challenge Cup game or did, was, it, was it all moving and shuffling and busy weekends for everyone? Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit stressed out with the house move, but I uh, I had it on in the background whilst I was packing boxes, and I uh, kept an eye on the Twitter feed. Um, you were very helpful in giving us match updates of the game that you got to, but yeah, how, how are you two doing? Yeah, I'm good. Um, I got on the uh, I got on the R League app on Sunday for uh, for the Challenge Cup, and I'm sort of it's I've got to work into my working week where to watch the uh, the Oral St James game and the. Uh, the, the game of sports now the Rochdale Mayfield game um, but won't spoil too much for fear but yeah, it's good to have rugby league back yeah definitely it was so good to get to a rugby league game live as well um, my plan this year is to go to a, a game in every round of the Challenge Cup um, I've, the final I go to every year I've been to the first round I've only got seven more games to go or something stupid so let's do this I'm definitely I think I'm going to go down to Aldershot on the 29th to, to do the Army versus Navy spoiler they both won their game um, but before we go into talking about the Challenge Cup and everything, uh, Robin, you're going to bring us your, your story of the week. Yeah, so uh, this week on, on our league, we saw Bentley take on Stanning Lee, uh, and that match was refereed by Caitlin Beavers. And so I wanted to talk about Caitlin Beavers t- tonight. Um, she's uh, It's a pretty inspirational story, I think. She's, um, she's very young, and she's got a, a really interesting career to date, so... Uh, we obviously we saw a referee in this game today, um, and she has been a referee since the age of 13. Uh, she's the first woman to referee a rugby league game at Wembley, and she's refereed at elite, uh, at League One level as well. So she's establishing herself uh, a fine a fine career in refereeing. Uh, I think she did a good job from from what I could uh, see and hear whilst I was watching the game. Um, and what makes this story especially interesting is that she's also the uh, first team fullback for Leeds Rhinos. So she's pursuing a career both in refereeing and as a player. So, and as a player, her, her career is even more um, staggering. So um, she's, won, she's won games basically as, as far back as I could read. She's been winning finals. She won the Year 11 National Schools and she scored 38 points. Um, she was a uh, player of the match in a, a Challenge Cup final for Dewsbury in 2018. She was then called into the uh, Leeds Rhinos first team squad from their academy. Um, she secured a spot in the team. Uh, she was only 16 years old for most of that season. Uh, and she helped the team win uh, the league leaders and they were grand, finals, grand final runners up. Uh, since then, she's played in cup finals, she's scored tries in grand finals, lifted grand finals, uh, and she's earned England appearances, and she's also been called up for, a, for the England squad for, for this year as well. Um, so th- the reason I wanted to, to bring this is because I just love the fact that we've seen um, a young person pursuing these different routes in rugby league. Um, when we were involved with the IFL a while back, they, they sort of told us how participation is a real key uh, aspect to what to keep in the sport um, going for as long as possible for the sustainability of the game, especially refereeing because it's not the most glamorous thing to do on a weekend. It's, it can be really difficult. It requires a lot of confidence and finding young people that are willing to take charge of a, an open-age game or, or even um, underage games You've got to worry about safety. You've got to be, you've got to try your best to keep the game flowing, make the right decisions. You've got a crowd that you've got to think about. They're giving you abuse, maybe. So it's um, it's good to see some a young person who's got the confidence and the skills to be able to do this. Uh, and it's and it's fascinating that she's got the experience on both sides. 
um, with regards to her being a woman, it's worth it's it's definitely worth mentioning because we are this is still an, a, a male dominated sport and she's um, breaking stereotypes um, and hopefully she's she's going to be able to inspire loads of young girls to also get involved in our sport and see the different methods um, of, of participating um, especially now because we've got the, the Women's Super League which was formed in 2017 and so she's sort of this first generation of player that's that's come into the system as it is and um, you know we've already got, she's already a superstar you know we've, we've only just sort of got this competition in this this format and we're already producing these like superstars who are just gonna have amazing careers so uh, we want we want to say like congratulations for everything you've achieved so far and we wish you the best of luck for 2022 Caitlin and we hope to see your career last for, for as long as you want it to I'm sure if you want to become an elite level referee player or even coach one day you, you'll be able to achieve whatever you want so we're all massive fans and um, yeah, that's the, st- that's the story of the week. Yeah, she's following the footsteps of um, Katie Badger and Belinda Sharp over in the NRL, but also yeah. um, Julia Julia Lee, who was the first woman to officiate a men's rugby league game in the United Kingdom. So four women there who have stepped out of a comfort zone that, like you said, into a, into a male-dominated sport and have, 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 well, have led the game. I've refereed a juniors game once and... It was horrible. I, I was like, no, I'm never refereeing again. I know it's one thing I just wouldn't want to do. I always get asked, do you want to do them? Do you want to do your refereeing badges? I don't. I really don't want to do them. I, I don't think I'd have yeah. I'd have the bottle to be able to stand up to it. Like you said, they get loads of abuse. Um, but but congratulations to her on on everything she's doing. And she's not like you said. She's the Leeds Rhinos fullback. She she's a first teamer. She's always she's probably one of the first names on the team sheet for Leeds Rhinos. But in October and November this year, she could be the first name on the team sheet for, for England. She should have been named in the 31 women's squad for um, the performance squad for the World Cup alongside multiple members of her, of her Valley Rhinos team, loads of St. Helens women. Just an absolutely fantastic thing. Before, before I name that squad, uh, Toby, do you, think, do you think Craig Richards is going to struggle when it comes to sort of n- narrowing a squad down? Because I think he has to narrow it to 25 so six of six women are going to miss out. Do you think he'll struggle? Um, oh, my voice went a bit then, but um, I, th- I think he'll. Um, I think he's what he's done is he's picked every player, uh, every English eligible player who's performed at, at a high standard. Um, I don't think that necessarily means he's picked. You know, he's he's got a squad full of uh, world class standards for the women's game. Um, I think there's sort of a reality that there's. St Helens and Leeds are dominating, um, are dominating the women's game at the moment, and I think that's something where, sort of go. I think going forward, um, we'll see that sort of narrowing down process happen. But being able to turn around to women who are standing out at sort of the effectively smaller teams within women's Super League, being able to say, look, here's your chance to prove that you're as, you're on the level of the regular winners. I think, uh, regular competition winners is uh, is sort of a great standard but I think it won't be too difficult for him because I think you know the women's game is at a point where it is the the, the actual player pool of players you want to be facing Australia with is just a little bit smaller than that squad yeah the, the standouts in, in the England women's squad are uh, Saints centre Amy Hardcastle Leeds teenage centre Fran Goldthorpe and um, York's new signing in uh, t- young fullback Tara Stanley who Individually, they are absolutely fantastic players. You've got Holly Dodd is another one from York. Sharon Ahoy is Huddersfield Giants' only representative in the team. Emily Rudge, Jody Cunningham are in there. Like you said, Caitlin Beavers we've already mentioned. Georgia Roach is in there. An off-season Castleford arrival, uh, and Leeds Rhinos for Shakira Bennett is is a new addition into the squad. She, it, she's one of the only players that hasn't been named in the squad yet. But I'll go through the team now. From Leeds, you've got uh, Daniel Anderson, Caitlin Beavers, Kira Bennett, Fran Goldthorpe. Amy Johnson, Chloe Kerrigan, Emma Lumley and Georgia Roach. Uh, from York City Knights, you've got uh, Savannah Andrade, Holly Dodd, Grace Field, Casey Gentle, Tara Stanley and Olivia Wood. And then from St. Helens, 12 names. This is a long list. You've got Leah Burke, Chantelle Crowell, Jodie Cunningham, Amy Hardcastle, T- Tara Jones, Carrie Roberts, Emily Rudge, Beth Stock, P- 
Paige, Travis, Vicky Whitfield, Naomi Williams, Rachel Woozy, and then from Wigan, uh, Rebecca Greenfield, Vicky Moyne, Rachel Thompson, and Georgia Wilson. And then, like I said, this the sole the sole name from Huddersfield Giants is, is Shona Hoyle. There's a lot of names there we recognise. We watched the England women versus Wales women back in uh, back towards the end of the season. I believe it was October time, September October time. Um, at the end of the year, once once we knew that the World Cup wasn't happening, they arranged the fixture. Yes, they dismantled the Welsh team, and you'd expect that. And you think the only tough, I reckon the only tough game they've got in their group is probably Papua New Guinea. Do you think? Do you think they can finish top of that group with Brazil and Canada in there as well? Or I was going to say, I think if they don't, then there's a serious review into the women's game. I mean, obviously the women's game is not is nowhere near the point where we all want it to be. Um, but I think in terms of you know the energy that gets put into the women's game here, I think that is it's an absolute necessity to top the group. Um, so that's just my opinion. What about yourself, Roman? Do you think do you think that squad is is good enough to, to top the group, and if not, potentially win the World Cup? Yeah, yeah. Realistically, you'd you'd want them to top the group, wouldn't you? Um, whether they'll win the World Cup, it's it's another thing. Both Australia and New Zealand are so strong. Um, it, it's they're definitely in, in with a shout, and you know, ho- hopefully they can do it because I think it'll it'll give us a bit of extra momentum. It's already growing, and that would be fantastic. But yeah, I don't know. New Zealand and Australia are looking very strong. Yeah, they're they're a very very strong team, and we'll we'll, we'll talk more about the women's England, the women's um, the World Cup as it comes throughout the season. But we do have to mention that today they announced the women's Super League fixtures. Um, for this season we haven't gone through them as a collective yet so we'll probably have to discuss them next week at some point and it's something that we will definitely definitely do um but i, I want to talk about the challenge cup we need to talk about the challenge cup before we move on to, to our main topic of, of discussing the championship my player of the round this week has to come from the game that i went to um arguably a number of players stood out for me um in, in the thing in the game and, and a number of players have stood out overall in terms of the first round i'm just going to name a couple of players that um a rugby league page on facebook i don't know if you two follow it's rugby league daily they've looked at their players of the round uh they've put they their players are jared bassett from west warriors he scored a hat trick in round one as they absolutely absolutely went and dismantled jarrow vikings james tilly from the royal navy uh defensively strong when bridge end got on attack to stop them getting through and despite not um, and another hooker that despite not scoring just managed to push his team around the park where he needed to go Sam Arrowsmith from Lee Miners Rangers apparently absolutely first team debut solid absolutely absolutely solid against the Wiggins and Pat side that historically are quite tough to beat York A4 in rugby league uh, Adam Endersby uh, he rolled back the years this weekend at 40 years old he led York Acorn into a man, in a man of the match performance so so well done to him uh, Rochdale Mayfield there was um Yian Higgs, um, he scored two tries, assisted another, got Rochdale Mayfield on the attack. I think you guys would have seen that if you watched the game. Apparently he was mentioned quite a bit on, on commentary. Uh, but for me, they also mentioned Luke Townend uh, from London Chargers as well. He recently joined the club having played for Stanning Lee in the University of Leeds. And he was he was a player that when he came onto the pitch for Chargers, their game sped up a bit. He was their, he was their second hooker on the day. He got onto the pitch. He scored a brilliant solo try. Oh, it was outstanding. He managed to step off both feet multiple times, uh, and he did. And he and he helped set the charges up for for a clash against the Scholars in round two. But for me, it has to be Eric Sims. Um, the, he started hooker for Charges, and he, he he was a little bit slow to start, really really slow to start. But when him and Luke Townend were on the pitch together, they were so in in sync. They were, one was if one wasn't there, the other one was. They were just his his game just up to up to level towards the end of that game as, as uh, Ellingwood Rangers started to tire, and as Adam Sim p- claimed the ball at first receiver with seconds remaining, stepped off his left foot and then back inside and just dropped the ball off to Eric Sims. He saw he saw the gap. He saw his eyes light up and he went for it. And those of you that watch it on YouTube, you can see the celebrations in the pictures down below. Robin now and next to Toby. It was absolutely outstanding. That game was unreal. I think, but but well done, Eric Sims. I think is our player of the round. My, certainly my player of the round. But so many of those players this week probably deserve it. But we just haven't been able to see everybody play. 
Um, it's, it's been a tough one. I think you. I don't really. I can't really ask you two what you think of it because you weren't there to see it. But I think if I, I just feel bad because that deserved to be a televised game. There was not more than six points in it across the whole of that match. Sounds like a good game. What was the what was the crowd like? What was the atmosphere like on the day? The atmosphere was good. Um, Edinburgh had a few travel down with them. It looked like they travelled down the night before in a bus, um, which was quite nice. They had a, they had a probably twenty or so people come down with them, which I think that's a it's a long way. We think we yeah. said I think we yeah. said it was one of the longest journeys of the first round, if not the longest. Oh, sorry, I had a hiccup there. Um, so yeah, it was nice. It was a lot of. Playing, playing at a rugby union club, the weather, it was so cold. It was really, really cold. Surprisingly, not as many people as I thought would be there from necessarily the south of England. I thought a few there was a few lads from Brixton, uh, some lads from South London were there. But it's really nice to see two of the London teams get, get wins this weekend. And I tell you what, on the 29th or the 30th, whichever day these two decide to play, London Scholars versus London Chargers has got to be one of the places to be, I think. It sounds really positive to see, sort of, be, you know, being able to say a team from Cumbria have had their work cut out for them by, by London-based team um, is, is, is fantastic. Um, I think it's showing that the game is growing um, and that the quality of sort of coaching um, and the quality of players that are able to sort of, yeah. you know, be in London and the south of England now is getting better because I think there was a time where this was unimaginable. Um, and, yeah, so it's really positive. Um, it's, I don't, oh, obviously, I remember you texting, I was walking through a train station and I was like, why is my phone going off so much? <laughs> and you were there going, oh my God, you cannot believe what's just oh, happened. It was so good, man. Was and so I happy. think anything that causes that kind of reaction is definitely uh, deserving of player of the round. From Eric, Eric Sims? Yeah, Eric Sims from London Chargers. Um, I'll probably see you during the summer when you rip at, when you rip Bedford Tigers to shreds. Um, but congratulations, man. You're the Biff's first ever player of the week. So congratulations to you. Um, but we need to... Robin, what, before I go into sort of the, the roundup and, and we sort of chat about every single game really quickly, what, what game... Did anyone stand out for you in any games? Did you, watch, did you actually watch any games despite all the moving? Did you manage to well, catch anything? Well, yeah, like I say, I was um, watching the... Hardly watching the highlights. <laughs> um, I managed to catch uh, a bit of the, the Stanley Lee... Um, standing the game, um, but it's just you know you, you forget kind of how how good the players are in these divisions. I think yeah. it's it, it brings it brings them up to um, it, it it brings up all these teams that you never really follow through the season because you've got much bigger games going on. Yeah, and it brings them all to the surface, and you get to see and and I was I was actually impressed with the the quality. So um, yeah, I think. Uh, next round should be should be good to see what the teams matching up that have won it as well. So yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah, no, it should be um, it should be absolutely fantastic. Before we go um, into anything, I will before we continue on to sort of what the Hall of Fame and we hand over to Toby and he's gonna gonna explain his his Hall of Fame for us. I'll just run through sort of what happened in the first round for everyone listening and everyone watching, and then you can we can sort of. I can then say what the second round ties will be afterwards for us. So, uh, Friday night, the British Army, sorry, no, Friday night, the Royal Navy travelled to Bridgend to play Wales and absolutely romped home to a 60-0 uh, win in the first match of the 2022 season. Uh, the Army then, on Saturday, came from behind after being 10-0 down with 11 minutes to go to beat Oral St. James 18-10 to set up... Um, the Army versus the Navy on the 29th of January at 2pm at Aldershot Military Stadium. I'll be there. I will be there. It's a, it's a near four-hour journey, so a near eight-hour round trip, and there'll probably be cancellations in London, but I'll be there. Catch me there. Um, Thornhill Trojans denied the services a clean sweep as they beat the RAF 24 points to six uh, to earn a trip to the Eco Power Stadium to face Doncaster when the League One clubs enter the, the competition at the second round stage. The GP police also lost out 28-0 to Siddle, uh, which is a little bit disappointing for, for the GP police. I think they were hoping for a bit of an easier tie. Siddle's obviously quite a tough one. Um, like I said, the Chargers already beat uh, the Edinburgh Rangers 22-16 in Chiswick, so they'll face the London Scholars 
at um, the New River Stadium in round two. The other London community side in the first round, West Warriors, uh, who beat the Chargers in last year's Southern Conference League Grand Final, uh, progressed with a 52-10 win after a long journey to play Jarrow Vikings at, at uh, the Newcastle Falcons Rugby Union Ground at Kingston Park. Uh, they travel again north in round two to face York Acorn, who overcame a spirited challenge from the Edinburgh Eagles. Um, Robin, you must be pretty chuffed about that result before we move on. Yeah, yeah, I think they, uh, I think Edinburgh played really well, so I think it was uh, quite a tough game in the end. So, yeah, we kind of uh, got away with it, you could say, and um, live to fight another day. But, yeah, they, they definitely um, won't be taking them lightly if they have to travel up there again. No, definitely not. I think I said we. I think we tried to speak about this last night. Try and persuade the missus to let you have a walk up the road and go and watch this one. I think Toby, you said you yeah. might even try and take a trek up to York to go and watch this one as well. Um, yeah, you built up the West Warriors so <laughs> much so when we last spoke that I've got to go and see them now, don't I? Yeah, you, I think you should. I genuinely think you should. Um, speaking of teams not necessarily based in England, Galway Tribesmen, the Irish champions, they had the longest journey ever. Um, for their for their first round ever. home home ever. for their for the longest journey ever for a home fixture um, as they had to travel all the way to St Helens to play Pilkington Rex. Their ferry arrived at two a.m. on the morning of the match and they still threatened to cause a major upset when they led ten eight at half time. Uh, but Pilkington stretched away to win thirty six ten and they'll play Siddle in the second round. Like I said, who like we said earlier beat the GB Police twenty eight nil. Um, Lee Miners Rangers won the tightest tie of the day as they uh, beat Milford 22-10 um, and they'll relish the prospect of taking on Anthony Murray's North Wales Crusaders side in the second round. Toby, it's not the win you want. You were really praying Milford would come through this one, weren't you? Yeah, although if it's going to be that close a game, I don't think it would happen. <laughs> uh, other, like, yeah, uh, it's, it's a good result. It's one of those when you, you load up the fixture the result and you go you look at what were the close games um, and yeah, I bet there was I bet there's some great stories from that game, which uh, which sadly we'll, probably won't know about <laughs> fully. But well done, Lee. You know, it's, it's a shame you won't make it to the third round. <laughs> oh, that's 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 your prediction <laughs> in for that one then, because it's definitely going to be the one one that we pick. Um, Rochdale, Mayfield, and Wigan, St Pat's contested an excellent cup tie, which was streamed live on the Sportsman. So thank you very much for that. That was three streamed games this weekend. I think it was three or four streamed games this weekend. Um, Mayfield running out 36-22 winners but St Pat's offering plenty of encouragement to the former Wigan and Great Britain scrum half Andy Gregory following his return to first uh, as his first community club as a coach um, Mayfield now face a tough, tough trip to West Hull who dismantled Upton 46-6 um, West Hull are a really really strong side, they've got a lot of lads that, that used to play League 1 a lot of lads that have previously played at academies for Super League and Championship sides before Everything was dismantled. Lock Lane claimed a notable 18-10 win against Battle Heath Crusaders. Toby, you predicted that one. Me and Robin thought it would be the other way. Um, the National League champions who uh, enjoyed a Challenge Cup run to the fifth round back in 2019, now losing in the first round. The Cass Club will now travel to Oldham in round two. Um, and Stanningley were the final team to book their place in round two as they overcame Bentley 16-22 in a hard-hitting affair live on our league on Sunday afternoon. Uh, after it was level at the break, um, the visitors took control and ensured a trip to Hunslet Club Parkside, who, like we said last week, were co are coached by Paul McShane, and they romped to a 56-6 win at Featherstone Lions. Um, that means that the second round ties to be played on January the 29th and 30th, so in, um, in about 10 days' time at time of um, production, York Acorn welcome the West Warriors. Uh, Rochdale Hornets will play the Midland Hurricanes, which kicks off at 1pm on Sunday afternoon and will be streamed live on BBC Sport. Doncaster welcome Thornhill Trojans. The Army and the Navy, they play at 2pm at the Unders Aldershot Military Stadium on Saturday the 29th. Lock Lane travel to Oldham. Pilkington Rex will play Siddle. West Hull versus Rochdale Mayfield. Hunslet Club Parkside versus Stanningley another I believe Premier Division NCL tie Hunslet versus Keithley Cougars Lee Miners Rangers versus North Wales Crusaders West Wales Warriors versus Swinton Lions and arguably the second best rivalry fixture of the week London Scholars versus London Chargers lads which apart from the two obvious ones the, the Army and Navy well probably the three obvious ones the Army Navy Hunslet Club Parkside Stanley and London Scholars London Chargers which ones stand out for you? 
any time that there's a you know a semi pro club against an amateur club, I'm going to be interested in it. Although, I you know who knows, but so obviously um, Doncaster, Thornhill, uh, Oldham, Lock Lane, Lee Miners, Rangers, North Coast Crusaders all sound interesting to me. But it's it's something where you take a risk if you know with look with those games because it could be a blowout or it could be a really you know an upset. But those those always stand out to me. Um, I think York Acorn West Warriors is. Uh, did, did you say that as one? This is one that stands out anyway. But that's something really interesting, just in respect of this West Warriors side. Like I've, I've got a feeling they can go far, um, just from what we, what we sort of know about them. Um, and other than that, I mean, it's, it's just a lovely mix. The sides I don't care about are the ones we'll see in League One all season. <laughs> um, but that might be a little bit harsh. But Rochdale Midlands Hurricanes, it might, it might be. I might be able to be busy that day. <laughs> If, uh, if depending on what else is on, no, nah, I think I definitely yeah, watched that. I yeah, I, I was going to say the Rochdale Midlands game stands out to me because they'll be playing each other all year, but they're you know they're regular season fixtures. This is a, a a massive game. It's a knockout, so it's got something different about it. And you know they're, they're right at the start of the season, so it kind of forms out the window. So I'll be looking looking forward to watching that game actually. Yeah, because I think if they don't win this week, the League One season doesn't start till mid March, I believe. So they've got a long way to go between this fixture and potentially their first league fixture. So it's it the same same for these amateur clubs. They're playing the Challenge Cup now, but for example, West Warriors and London Chargers, their first league game won't be till April potentially, the end of towards the end of April. So it's a long time to wait if they do go out in round two. And some of these teams obviously out the first round. There's a long, long, long time to go. But um, that's it for the Challenge Cup. We can't really go on too much about it. We will talk about the round two in more depth next week once we know a little bit more we'll try we'll try and get um, a spokesman for one of the teams that are playing in the second round whether that be scholars charges whether that be royal navy um, wherever we'll try and get someone to talk to so fingers crossed we can sort that out for you but I'm going to pass on to Toby now it's Toby's turn to induct somebody into the Biff Rugby League Hall of Fame me and Robin know what it is and I'm trying not to to have a little bit of a, a laugh because I think this one is it, it's not a funny one but it's 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 one that we knew was coming um so Toby take take it away my friend yeah there's a certain element when we decided that we're going to uh all pick Hall of Fame uh candidates there is that element of like we need to set the foundation um and as part of that foundation as who we are as as people who sit here and talk about rugby league um I, I couldn't not induct as my first inductee the uh, North Wales Crusaders 2013 squad. Uh, it was the only promotion season that the North Wales Crusaders have had in there since 2012 when they were uh, sort of formed slash reformed as a club uh, from the Celtic Crusaders. Um, it was quite it was quite an incredible season, really. They won the Northern Rail Bowl, which quite a, quite a fun competition. It was the, I think it's the only away game I've actually been to with North Wales Crusaders. <laughs> I went to a witness away in a friendly once, but anyway, um, I was in Halifax and that was a great day. Um, probably the day which made me fall in love with rugby league the most and understand rugby league the most was that Northern Rail as as a thirteen year old, twelve year old, was that Northern Rail Bowl, um, cup game. But that's not what's important about that season. <laughs> Win it, winning a trophy, because they won another one later <laughs> on in the season. It was uh, lost to Oldham in round something it was five games before the end of the season lost to Oldham 28-10 from there they beat Gateshead away by four points they beat Hemel Stags 44-12 at home they beat Oxford 54-10 at home and then the final day of the season came around the 1st of September and it was a North Wales versus South Wales derby North Wales need, the Crusaders needed one point to win the league <laughs> It was 22 all at uh, one point in the game. North Wales Crusaders were down to 12 men because Jamie Dallimore, now a Barrow legend as well as a North Wales Crusaders legend, had been sent off for a spear tackle in like in the 21st minute. They won the game 30, uh, 35 to 22. They lifted the trophy at the race course in front of 1,562 people, the h- highest attendance of that season. In fact, that season there were six games which in the regular season attended by over a thousand fans. Four of them involved North Wales Crusaders, um, and that was both including home and away support. 
Um, they Oldham then came, uh, Oldham then got all the way to the playoffs and lost to Rochdale. So it was one of those really nice. They were the team we had to beat, and then they were the team who beat us. We then had to go on a mad win, and they didn't even make it up with us anyway. <laughs> um, it was and the nostalgia I get just from looking at the scores and seeing Gloucestershire all goals, Hemelstag, Gateshead Thunder in that league, yeah. and just remember playing them playing them at the racecourse ground before North Wales had to move grounds on multiple occasions um, to be more financially viable. Yeah, it was incredible. And if you look at the squad that played against South Wales that day, I'll just pick out some names. You've got Tommy Johnson, who at this point in time has played 186 games for North Wales Crusaders, uh, 67 tries, 630 goals, and he signed on for next season. Uh, also in that squad, you had John O'Smith, who was went to Barrow Raiders and played many championship uh, games for them and Toby Adamson went to, ended up at Lee Centurions quite a well known championship player um, Christian Rowett Welsh international and I'm sure I could go on <laughs> also Clive Griffith an incredible coach um, and yeah Clive, uh, Clive Griffith just the things he did for, for not only rugby league but also sort of Welsh rugby league um, w- was wonderful um, and that I believe was his final season 2014, North Wales Crusaders were in the championship when they decided to bring in the, the Super 8 system, I believe, which ended up getting us organised back into League 1, but we were like, we finished in like ninth or 10th, and we were like, you know, we really had to go, we went back into League 1 with a grimace, um, and we've been there ever since, but yeah, the most incredible season, um, double winners, um, quite, quite, quite a remarkable achievement. And uh, the 2013 North Wales Crusaders team will be the second inductee into the fifth, or I guess third, fourth, fifth, seventh, sixth, seventh, ninth. <laughs> uh, up to thir- up to 30. If you include the head coach and the assistant coach, they are from the second to the 33rd member of the of yeah. the rugby league hall of fame. Yeah. <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> but no, John Fieldhouse, your assistant coach that year, former former Halifax, over 100 games for Halifax and over 100 games for Orrington, played for Widnes Saint Oldham. South Wales as well. He was a South Wales player. Um, Whitehaven and Witness played for South Wales back in 1996. So, um, yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of quality names in and around that squad, both on and off the pitch. A name I thought you might mention was Stuart Reardon, who was also in that squad um, for North Wales Crusaders. And obviously, the listeners out there should know who Stuart Reardon is. He's, he has played over near enough 250 games, um, scoring 82 tries. And they played two games for England, five games for Great Britain. So it was the only in up until twenty seventeen, Stuart Reardon's testimonial shirt was the only North Wales Crusaders branded shirt I didn't own. Uh, wow. Much, yeah. Um, <laughs> and that, that then started the demise. But yeah, um, he, he did have an incredible career. The other mention would be Andy Mosdale, who was a halfback who's now <laughs> like the North Wales Crusaders CEO or something along those lines. You know. Operating officer, but yeah, um, I, I love your entry, Toby. I, I feel like this is what we all, all sports fans just get it, don't they? This is what we're here to to see these seasons. It's yeah. tough sometimes when your team's not too successful, and you, you get those dream seasons that line up and they're treasured memories. Um, being from from York, there's obviously like I I'm so lucky to have so many teams around me nearby. I could decide to be a Leeds fan tomorrow, and I'd all of a sudden have won loads of trophies. I could be a Cass fan. I could be a, a Featherstone fan and be the top of championship. And they're all within an hour's drive from me. What's, what's it like down in Wales? You know, the, the, they're your club, I'm guessing, not really by choice. It's it's because they're the only ones. Yeah, so effectively what happened, wasn't it, is Celtic Crusaders could, wasn't working in South Wales and they were like, North Wales is closer to, uh, mm. <laughs> to the M62 than, uh, <laughs> than South Wales. We'll move up there. And yeah, I mean, obviously, I remember, I remember when they were a club, and you'd have like Leeds, and Leeds would pack out an away end the same yeah. size as like the football, you know, the biggest <laughs> teams you'd play in the football would be in that away end, and Leeds would like fill it, um, and things like that. So I think there was always this, and then the North Wales Crusaders forming as a League One club lost a lot of lost a lot of sort of like you know Super League fans, um, or like you know the highest level fans. But the way that kept sport together for the longest time, you know, I would I would say that 2012 to 2015, you know, they were the best. They were some of the best fans going. 
the North Coast Crusaders fans and things have happened since then which have caused fans to drop off and I won't get into it because we're not here for that negativity at the moment <laughs> but it's something where yeah it's um, it's quite remarkable really when you saw at the, especially during this tour of 2013 this was a growing side to the point where it was looking like rugby league was genuinely going to become a bit of a hot spot in the local area um, and that was something which was quite incredible that we'd created this mini sort of but uh, yeah things happened but anyway yeah um, do, you, do you think if the liquidation of the crusaders hadn't have happened in 2011 they would have potentially moved to north wales anyway um it's difficult to say i think there was always well as soon as that they'd moved up north and then folded um or you know that kind of thing there was already sort of rival bids to a semi-pro rugby league team in in north wales um so it's something that i feel like it looked like it was sort of bound to happen um but yeah it's very it's sort of very difficult to say um you know i think it was i think honestly away fans probably made that club sort of grow into what it was for that period of time um because being able to bring more you know fans looking saying oh, it's only a two hour trip or whatever rather than the four hour trip it was down yeah. to south wales instantly you start to see every week what rugby league's about to to the people of yorkshire and the people of lancashire um and i think that probably then inspired a generation of sort of rugby league there so i think it's something where you know that is something that can work going forward um as well if you sort of take those lessons yeah no really 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 good to hear one quick question that i think it's going to be i think robin knows what's coming i think you might know what's coming um do you think ryan reynolds and his his co-op will put some money into North Wales like they did with Wrexham Football Club, seeing seeing as they're both Wrexham and they're both at the same both at the same stadium. Oh yeah, so North Wales have had to move to Colon Bay now. To um, yeah, they've moved to Colon Bay to because of financial losses and things like that. Um, but it's something where I have sources um, <laughs> which say that there's not that they're going to put any money into it, anything like that, but that. Wrexham's always in the back of North Wales Crusaders' mind. No, that's, that's always, that, you know. Yeah, that's what we like to hear, especially if you say they've got the, the fan base there as well. Yeah, so as I say, they're always in the back of the mind, and um, the fans have been really good this year. Actually, at travelling up, you, you know, they 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 genuinely hire a bus to take them forty five minutes up the road so they can all be drunk at the games and things like this. <laughs> Which, when you think about, you know, how many clubs could organise that. But yeah, so I think Wrexham will always be in the back of the mind, but I think it's at a point probably where, you know, it was high. I think uh, Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney have already learned enough about a new sport for a couple <laughs> of years at least. No, that's, that's really good. Um, that's quite apt that you're, you're picking the championship winning side and being promoted into the championship because that, that's today's main topic. It's taken us nearly 40 minutes to get there, but we're finally here. It, it's time for our Betfred Championship preview. Um we spoke about it a little bit yesterday. We have picked, we have decided where we think these teams are going to finish, um, and we're and we're going to start at the bottom because obviously you, we always work our way up. We always go bottom to top when we when we when we're doing predictions to to keep that sort of suspense a little bit. We don't want to ruin it by saying, "Oh, this team are going to finish first and then nobody's bothered. Um, but first up, well, not first up, fourteenth up. Um, this was this was mainly a, a down to you, Toby, because you you saw these teams play last year and. You know where, you sort of know the level that they're at, and you know how they they potentially improved. Um, but you've got Workington Town finishing bottom of the league after a promotion. Yeah, um, well, throughout the course of the whole season, um, Barrow, Barrow, you know, were the league leaders. Um, there was an element of Barrow. They had a sort of, they had a patch. Yeah, you know, I saw them lose to Crusaders um, last season, and they definitely had a patch where they started the season at their best possible level and as everyone sort of hit fifth gear they stayed in fourth if that kind of makes sense um so there was definitely an element of that but when i sort of compare two squads um going into this season um i just can't look past the sort of the signing of someone like jared summer in an attempt to stay up um so barrow would I, I, and that kind of experience um, when the only goal they can truly have is to stay up, um, you know, I think it's something that 
will be quite important. And I hope, uh, again, I hope for the prediction sake that um, Workington are 14th and Barrow are 13th. Um, but at the, you know, by the same token, it's always nice to have that old full Cumbrian derbies within a league. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, I think that Barrow this season are trying harder to stay up rather than you know, rather than any other sort of intention. There's not intention to grow into the league. There's not an intention to you know even outperform themselves. I think it is very much they they know what they they've done everything they can possibly do to to, to try and stay up. Um, fortunately, we don't think they're going to get there. No, I think. I, I said that I don't think this London Broncos side is going to be a bit poor this year. I said this. We said the Dewsbury Sheffield Wigan side looked quite quite weak compared to previous seasons, but not as weak as the Barrow and the Workington side are. Uh, Robin Barrow have got Hakeem Maludi, and they've got who did who did, which who did you say have signed Jared Summit? Was that Barrow Raiders as well? Both yeah, both yeah. The, both the thingy. They're both quite well, arguably Hakeem Maludi is a a top end Championship lower end Super League player, and Jared Summit realistically. Should be on his talents. Should be playing at the in the top half of the championship as well, but they're not enough, are they, to keep to keep Barrow safe? No, I mean the championships are really interesting competition because the difference between the the top teams and the bottom teams is is massive. Um, so yeah, two two players isn't enough to do it. I mean, um, Jared Summer, he he played he played um, against uh, York for London last year, and and he tore us apart. So. I'm sure he will improve. I'm sure there'll be games that they'll win this year that they wouldn't have if they didn't have Summer. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a long year and there's some there's some competitive sides, so it's not enough this year to to put it all on two players. No, and and I think the next the next thing that's going to shock shock players or shock listeners even is that as a collective, we kind of thought well, I said this this London Broncos team is not very good compared to the last couple of seasons. A lot of their players have decided to either have not re-signed contracts, they've gone part-time, and the players that they have brought in, yeah, they've got an okay forward pack. They've got Wellington Albert, Lewis Gienek, Rhys Curran, Brad Foster, uh, Jordan Williams is in there. Um, they've got Dean, per- uh, Dean Perasta at hooker. Will Lovell is going to probably captain the side from the second row or loose forward. But when you're looking at the likes of Ilias McCartney, Dalton Grant, and that's sort of your lot in the back line. Um, yes, they've got Rian Horseman and Ollie Leyland who have come through the academy. But we've got we've got London Broncos finishing 12th here. Jermaine Coleman has come from London Scholars to, to be their head coach. It, it's not a strong Broncos side, is it? It's not the same. It's it's a Broncos side that three seasons ago we argued shouldn't have been relegated from, from Super League. But now we're saying, could they potentially get relegated into League One? Yeah, there's teams coming up, you know, I think a lot of our discussion about this, we were talking sort of about squad sizes, especially during the Greenland Championship season. 1 to 13, London have a team that that might finish higher than 12. I just think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of holes in the team. Um, you know, there's, <laughs> not the greatest way to look at it, but there's a lot of non-clickable links in the squad on, on Wikipedia. <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely um, there's something there where it's just it's not the Broncos team that uh, that we think of of recent years. You know, the Broncos team that was so good in Super League. Um, and when you look at the, the teams around who are strengthening and are bringing in players who you've seen play at the top end of the championship, I just don't think that that's something that's happening um, at the Broncos this season. No, we we said. They're going to finish 12th. We think they might finish 12th. But we have got them finishing below a Dewsbury team, which which, when we talked about it yesterday, it kind of shocked us a little bit. Because Dewsbury, when you looked at their team, they haven't got loads of standout players. Um, yes, they've got Michael Nose, They've got Chris Anakin. They've got Jason Walton. But they've got the likes of Reese Butterworth, Harry Kidd. These are young players. They, It's not necessarily a good team. But they've got stuff to play for. Keenan Tomlinson, obviously there. Jake Sweeting there. Uh, John McGrin, Brad Graham. They've got some players that they'll sign, uh, they've picked up, that are going to be good enough to do a job. But why, why Why do we... What was it that made us think London are going to finish lower than lower than Dewsbury on that on that squad selection? Yeah, For me, the Dewsbury team is one that's been built to prove itself. Um, I think there's a lot of players here who do not see themselves as being 
a, a, a team that finished like, finishes that low in the championship like they did last year. And I think there's a lot of sort of want to, to push on from these players. Um, you know, it's not long ago that I remember Butterworth playing in the, you know, sort of on the fringes of Super League. Um, Ross Peltier being outstanding for, I believe it was Bradford. Yeah, it was Bradford. Um, yeah, I believe it was Bradford. So, yeah. Um, and I think there's just, I think there's ambition within this Dewsbury team that's something which we, we didn't see really from London last year. And I just think that, well, you, you, know, you talked about the head coach but coming over from Scholars and things like that. Just It seems like London are having to cut back finances and things like this, whereas it seems like Dewsbury have got their budget together and they've gone, what's the best possible squad we can get together? Maybe gone for players who are looking to prove themselves this season and get a move higher up into the sort of table next season. But I just sort of like the sort of what they're building in terms of um, squad that's eager to not be at Dewsbury. But I, it's how I sort of see it. But in the same way, that works really well, I think, for sort of playing well on the pitch this year. Yeah, definitely. It, it's going to be tough. I think I think we did say off camera yesterday that Dewsbury and London will probably finish next to each other. Either one will finish above the other, depending on, I think, the results of when those two teams play each other. Uh, and that could potentially be how close it gets. Um, yesterday, we said that the Sheffield Eagles side... It, they've made some good improvements, but we couldn't we couldn't find a full squad for them. We weren't we weren't really able to judge them properly. But we put we've put them finishing tenth this year. They they just about finished twelfth last year. Um, they they were they were well clear of not being relegated. They weren't they weren't likely to be relegated. We knew that, but they didn't seem to click very very well. Um, but their squad this year numbers this is their numbers. So they've got uh, Josh Guzdek. Ben Jones, Bishop, Connor Bauer, Ross Oates, Jason Bass. I believe he's a, a former York player. Is, um, yeah. Isaac Farrell, Anthony Thackeray, Brandon Douglas, James Davey, Tyler Dickinson, Liam Johnson, Joel Farrell, Evan Hodgson, uh, Villa Halafi, Mikey Wood, Blake Broadbent, Liam Kirk, Martin Riley, Chris Wellham, Harry Tyson Wilson, Ryan Johnson, Matty Crimes, Bailey Louie, Will Wallace, Kadeem Williams and Ben Shields. Um, that's, a tw- that's a squad of 26. Not the biggest squad, but twenty six is good, isn't it? That's a, that's a strong twenty six man squad, and they're going to improve on on last year, aren't they? Yeah, Sheffield are a really hard team to judge because, um, like, when I was living down there, I'd go to a couple of games, and it would just be a different team every single time you watched them. Um, I think, uh, I think Jason Bass will go well for them. Um, he played he played well for York and. And I was quite proud to see him go. So I hope he, he has a good year for them. Um, Bakare, I think he's retiring at the end of the year. Yeah, so yeah. could go one of two ways. Either he turns it on and gives a good like send-off or it's one too many and he, he doesn't. He sort of slows them down a little bit. I think um, personally, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have held on to him this long. I, I never really rated him uh, when I watched him play down there. But, um, yeah, I, I, it's a difficult team to judge. Like you say, it's not the deepest squad. Um, hope they can stay fit. I know I know. off-field, they're back in there. Um, they're, they're at the Olympic Legacy Park in Sheffield, and they've actually had a new um, stand built. Before that, it was just kind of quite a temporary arrangement. So, hopefully, yeah. um, I know they play on Friday nights down there, and uh, hopefully they can get a good kind of match day experience. I definitely think if you're looking for a, an away fixture this year, Sheffield's a good option. It's um, in the in the middle of the country, so it shouldn't be too hard for people to get to. To play on a Friday night, you can get the tram down there, and then you've got a good night out in Sheffield after it as well. So, yeah, yeah I, I think off pitch, I'd like to see Sheffield grow. On pitch, I don't know if they've got the most competitive squad this year. Yeah, I still you think... send me the details of that tram, Robin, because I've been <laughs> looking. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. no, um, that, that was my thing with Sheffield was Chris Wellham. Super League experience. Uh, Ross Oaks, I mean, I think he's had some fantastic games for Bradford over the past uh, four or five seasons. Um, and yeah, and Ben Jones Bishop coming in as well. They're just a lot of sort of backline players, but um, it's something where I just, I got excited. Those names for me screamed high quality, you know, fringe Super League quality. Maybe even had an offer to be a third or fourth choice Super League player and they've they chose Sheffield 
and that's sort of why I was that's why I sort of pushed for Sheffield to be the best sort of kind of a best of the rest role that they're in um, here yeah I mean I think Toby you need to get yourself up to, to Sheffield on a Friday night it's a direct train from Derby it's not that far uh, so you could be maybe one of you could be maybe our Sheffield correspondent to get some championship games uh, viewed this year as well as some um, North Wales Crusaders games when you get a chance to go home during the summer um, the next team on our list as we get closer and closer towards the, the top half um, just outside Widnes Vikings um, finishing ninth we weren't particularly happy when we read through their squad yesterday and we looked at it and we were like oh this could be a tough one but Jack Owens is there they've still got Steve Tyra Jake Sp- uh, Spedding Danny Craven and Matty Smith obviously leading them in the halves but they've still got the likes of Shane Grady and Kenny Baker Joe Lyons Lloyd Roby Joe Edge They've got a lot of lot of young academy lads. Um, do you think these academy lads will be able to push them further up the table, or do you think do you think they'll struggle to even finish as high as as ninth? I think, like you say, they have they've, they have got some experience in there as well, and looking particularly at Matty Pozard at nine. So hopefully they've got the right balance um, of, of youth and experience. I mean, uh, the younger the younger squads tend to make it a bit further through the year before the injuries set in, so they might be sort of a little bit more consistent. Again, it's not the deepest of squads, so there's there's a, a, a risk. But um, I think I think they're building again. I think they've had a few years off the pace, um, but I think they're sort of back and, and able to look more towards the future again. So that's why I, I'm and putting them. Um, Mid mid table, um, yeah. What what do you think, Toby? Yeah, to an extent, I think this is kind of a lot of this is very similar to what we saw from London last year. Um, it's a lot of names that I ironically kind of know because they've been a North Wales player or they've been like a dual reg into League One or that kind of thing. Um, I think there's just there's certain things about it. Like you've got Joe Lyons who sort of broke through and now he's in the fourteen jersey. He'll be coming off the bench and things like that. But it's so you know there was a time where though that would be a player who would have been a mainstay in the starting team for two seasons. You said Danny Craven and yeah. um, Matty Smith, but you know it's that kind of like I think that there's that in they they know that they need to sort of mix experience with youth, um, and the combination just isn't getting they aren't getting it right. Um, for you know they're dropping down the table sort of slowly, um, but I actually it's weird because I see these names as a lot of names I recognise purely because of their location in relation. In, you know, in relation to me and sort of their youth academy being quite prominent. But yeah, I think it's, I don't think they've done anything with this squad that would suggest to me they're going to be sort of better than last year, whilst there's teams around them who are sort of pushing on. So yeah. Yeah, it's a shame because Witness are a team that everybody knows. Everybody has a has a memory of Witness Vikings, don't they? That That's seen a lot of rugby league anyway. Um, and But they are, in my head, they... They were a championship club, and they were they were they were very lucky to be cut to be to get into Super League the way it was the way it was done. But they were also very unlucky to not be a Super League club when the first lot of franchising came around. So I think the French the, when the franchising came in, it hit them quite hard because they had to drop their level, and they probably didn't deserve to be dropped to the level they've done. But they've worked so hard to make sure they stay. Yes, they've had some trouble some trouble off the field financially, but I think this is the season where if they can be solid maybe not really consistent but if they can play well every week and yes they'll probably lose to the top dogs that we're about to go into but if they can beat every single team below them and have a couple of wins against the teams above them I think they'll be okay heading into heading into sort of the later later half of the season and I think they just miss out on playoffs finishing ninth but um, we're, we're going to get now into the last team that's not going to finish in the top seven um, and I think this is this team is only in this position because of the players that they've lost during the uh, during the season. They've sold two to Halifax in Lou, um, Louis Jouffre and um, Lachlan Wormsley, two absolutely outstanding players for them last year. But Whitehaven, we put them eighth just because of the players that they just won't have available to them this season. It's an outstanding, yeah. I mean, they're outstanding players to lose to the point where I, part of me wants to say these could be players that sort of ruin their season and drop them down lots but I think for me I was never never see um, in, like stuff on social media 
about play, about Joffre and um, Lost Morsley carrying Whitehaven. No. They were just obviously an incredible part of the team effort. And I think that that team effort is something at Whitehaven that is very special. I think that they they are a absolute unit together. They play for each other. They play smart. They play hard. You know, they, I think they're just I think they just play the game at a, like at, in a way that makes them hard to beat. And I think that's something that can continue. But they have lost the players that would contribute to them pushing into a top seven. Yeah, the, their team numbers, as, as before, before I give you a chance to just sort of mention what your thoughts are on Robin, are uh, Geronimo Doyle at fullback, Dave Eccleston, uh, Chris Taylor, Will Evans, Andrew Bullman, Carl Dixon and Nicole Williams in the halves, Liam McAvoy, Callum Phillips, Tom Walker, Ryan King, Liam Cooper, Dion I are their 1 to 13. Then 14, James Neeson, Connor, Hall- Connor Halliday has been given 15, Tom Wilkinson, Andrew Dawson, Guy Graham, Jake Moore, Jake Bradley, Kieran Hudson, Josh Martin, Alex Bishop, and Glenn Riley. Um, obviously, Jesse Joe Parker, now not a member of the team. Chris Coward has retired. Uh, Shack- Mark Shackley, uh, club captain, has also retired. So they have lost a, a lot of their core heading into this season. I, just, I, I, I hope they can sort of put up a fight like they did last year. Do you think, do you think they might shock a few people, Robin? Or do you think that finishing just outside the playoffs is probably a good season for Whitehaven. Yeah, I think considering the the losses that they've got, this is a, a, a fair, realistic view of where the season's going to be. Um, I think it'll, it'll be interesting to see, was the success that they experienced last year down to that core of players, or was it a, a, was it bigger than them? Was it the, the attitude of the club as a whole? Uh, one one player that I did want to just draw our attention to was Geronimo Doyle, the the new halfback. Mm. Um, I I watched him play last year for Swinton in a team that uh, was pretty unimpressive, um, but he he was he was pretty good. I I think he'll be a good signing. He's a good pickup. He is definitely a championship player, so he he deserves his spot. Um, I think he was actually the Swinton player of the year as well so yeah, they've managed to they have managed to to replace some of those key players and, and especially in a key role like fullback that's that's going to do them well for the season yeah i'll let you sort of expand on who who, who we think is going to finish seventh and be the first team in, in our top half Robin, because you, you know this team very 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 well indeed um we've got the york city knights finishing seventh which th- this is where it got really difficult for us yesterday we were the top seven. We couldn't quite necessarily put in the same. Well, from teams four to seven, we really struggled to put in a position. And then the same from teams eight to, to ten. So we, we kind of struggled a little bit. But York City Knights to finish as low as seventh potentially this year. Yeah, I think it's um, the thing. The thing with York is they came, we came up from League One and a lot was expected of us. Um, and we get this kind of we get this kind of name to be a future um, Super League club, which obviously it's 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 achievable, it's doable, uh, and and I think not just from my biased point of view, it would be good for the game, but I think it also gives us this kind of expectation that's sometimes a bit unrealistic. Um, I think we've I think we've hired really well in the off season. Um, from what I've seen of them this year, I think they will go well, um, but. There's some really strong teams this year, and the thing with this club is they can they can go through a bit of a, a bit of a rough patch. I don't think I've ever watched a, a York night season that's been flawless, that's been um, without sort of games that you just think yeah. we should have won that. Do you know what I mean? We we should have won that. We're our own worst enemy. So um, I'm expecting a, a few a few rough patches, and I think this is a, a realistic look at the team. Um, We've got Jamie Ellis at half back, who is um, Super League standard. He didn't do he didn't do fantastic for us last year, so I'm still a bit on the fence about him. Um, we've got some some great outside backs. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing them play. Uh, and with the recent news of the um, new chairman on board, that's obviously just throwing just another variable into the mix. I think there's still a few years off getting right to the top of the table. But hopefully, you know, hopefully we will exceed expectations from my bias point of view. 
Yeah, I mean, just looking at your, your squad now, 25-man squad, so like you said, not amazingly deep, and, and you struggled a lot with like half-back pairings last year. Yeah. You had plenty of injuries throughout the team last year, so obviously this this is... We, we forget we forget that last year, that the reason you finished so badly, and you had a, pr- probably a poor season in terms of a York City Knights, like in through your York City Knights sort of tinted glasses, is because of the injuries. Um, people were sort of gunning for, for James Ford, and he signed a new contract, and it was... A bit, I think everyone was sort of like, this is the worst season they've ever had under him and they've just given him a new contract. It just goes to show how much the board trusts the coach and how much the, the coach trusts the players he's got. I mean, you've got Matty Marsh, you've got James Glover, Jacob Ogden, Will Oakes, just, um, well, Joe Brown. That's that's your back five. That's that's a really, really strong back five. Like yeah. you said, uh, Hagen and Ellis in the half-backs. Massey Matongo joining from Hull FC. Will Jubb at hooker. Jack Teensy, Chris Clarkson, Paulie Pauly. Jordan Thompson, a player, two players that I love in Sam Davis and Marcus and Marcus Stock, not given numbers in the starting thirteen. Ronan Dixon in there, Danny Kerman, Liam Liam Harris, a absolutely fantastic player last year at Halifax. Like he's only in the number nineteen shirt. Chris Brinning, you're not even your starting hooker, and then you've got the likes of AJ Taub, Ronan Michael, Jack Logan, Ollie Butterworth, and then you've got your your young lads in Toby Warren and, and Miles Harrison as well. There's a lot of household names in that York team. And a lot mm. of there's a lot of Super League quality. If they stay injury free, they probably finish higher than what we put them. But the teams above them are just that little bit better, aren't they? Yeah, and and importantly, they've not got dual registration in place this year. So I know it, it doesn't stop them from getting players, but it's just gonna it, with a, a squad so thin and our track record with injuries, it just leaves us exposed to these risks and and. Uh, I'm 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 keeping I'm keeping my hopes realistic this year because like you say there's some there's some really quality players, um, but I just I just think with the issues that we've had I can't I can't overlook them happening again. No, it's it's a really really tough one, isn't it? Sort of hoping that you finish higher than you did last year and hoping that you have a much better season, but if your team is ravaged with injuries again and, and just ripped apart because of injuries, you're you're going to struggle. We haven't finished in just below Bradford, though. Only by a spot, but that's because, Toby, you like the look of this Bradford team. Yeah, they've got five Welsh players. <laughs> um, they're going to do very well now. Um, it's, Deck Patton could well be signing of the of the championship season. Uh, him and Jordan Lilly, that's a half-back combination that we thought was going to be the England half-back combination by now. Didn't quite work out for them, but there's an element of of something there, you know, there's a chance that that produces something really special at Bradford. Um, they're not too, they're not too deep on the forwards in terms of experience. Um, but Sammy Kabula comes in, who's obviously tinkered on the edge of Super League. Um, we've got Jordan Baldwinson, George Flanagan, uh, Ben Evans, Anthony Walker, Steve Crossley, Aaron Murphy. So there's some players there who you know where you know you know that they're a prominent championship side. Um, we'll see how the season goes for them. Um, I'm not too convinced by an aging Elliot Keir at fullback, although again he's Welsh. Um, but there's um, you know I think there's something at Bradford where if John Keir is in a good mood this season, um, I think they'll be a very solid team and a hard team to break down. But also have something special coming through creative, creatively that will be helping the team. Yeah, I look at this tight team and they've they've snapped up Ryan Miller from Sheffield. You say you they snapped up Deck Patton in what you think could be the sign of the season. Sam Scott, he's 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 left York, hasn't he, to join Bradford? I believe is that a name that from York? Robin, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Why is that? Don't recognise him. Don't recognise him. It might not be. It's just a name I seem to remember. I might be totally wrong. They've got Dan Fleming up in a number twenty nine shirt. It just goes to show how much depth they've got. Eldon Myers, Sam Scott. yeah. Sam Scott played three years at York, Robin. <laughs> I think you are a Leeds fan, aren't you? You're definitely a Leeds and Sheffield fan over York. Sixty six games for you. I was going to say, I definitely saw him play against Witness a couple of years ago in the last wow. in one of the last games at Boozham Crescent. But Jesus, uh, they've just signed Elliot Hall. I believe they snapped him up from Coventry. Uh, they've got plenty of outside backs. They've got David Foggy Johnson in there as well, but no, they've got they've got a solid forward pack. They've got really nice. They're really short in the half backs though, and with Jordan Lilly being out for that first seven weeks, they really need to rely on deck pattern and 
the experience that he brings for the first half of the season. If they lose their first six games, or they only get two wins out of their first six or seven games, I think they're going to really struggle. And I think that's why we might have put them so low, because of the injury that Jordan Lilly's picked up in pre-season. But next up, Batley Bulldogs. Um, you like this team, Toby. You really like... You were saying yesterday you think they don't finish as, as low as fifth, but I don't think you could put them any higher than fifth. Yeah, I think I got I be, I got swept up with sort of how well they did last season as well. Um, but yeah, there's something about like I, I just think there's players there who um, who are waiting to be in Super League. Um, I think Luke Hooley he was a Wakefield Academy product who I think could have got there, maybe needs a bit more development. Tom Gilmore is I think someone we've seen play well in Super League for for Widnes before and. Um, Kieran Buchanan, I think, you know, he'll be a player who, as soon as the Super League club needs a centre, they'll be on the phone to Batley. Um, you know, Jody Broughton comes in. I don't know if he still was there last season as well, actually, but that's, yeah, um, was, yeah. you know, it's just Jack Logan. There's just there's just players there who I feel, who I feel Super League have either got an eye on or, you know, are, are about to have an eye on. And they showed last season their ability to play as a team, their ability to to, to work for each other and I think it's just something where I just think they're going to push on um, and end up in the, those playoff spots again Yeah, the, the Batley team is, is quite strong uh, it, I don't think their website's quite up to date though because they've, they've still got Elliot Hall playing some of them I believe he's definitely a Bradford player uh, this season so I think there may be a few players that we're not quite sure on there and I've not seen them post uh, a, a, their squad yet this season um, so hopefully their squad that we've, we that we've seen is an accurate one, because um, if it is, they'll do pretty well. But th- this 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 next one is a team that slowly but surely have been improving every year. They've shocked a few more teams above them. Newcastle Thunder we have finishing fourth. Um, they're they're going to be a definite playoff side, aren't they? I I think so. I think. They've got a vision to be in Super League, and I think there's nothing to suggest that then that, uh, there's nothing to suggest from the sort of season they've the season they've had the signings they're making. They're not gonna at least sort of you know push into letting people know that that's where they're going to end up um, this season. Yeah, Robin, what what do you think of this Newcastle team? Obviously, League One regulars they've they've absolutely smashed it when they were in league one they've come up and they've not been they've not done they didn't do what toronto did and splash the cash even though they've got it they they sort of sat there and they slowly but surely sort of picked away at the likes of witness yes they've picked and they've they've brought in alex foster from cass uh josh eaves has come in from st helens Kuma ties there nathan wild jake storrox and then they've got brad gallagher and lewis peachy as well also looks like they're on loan from from cass that, that's a decent squad they're going to have this year, isn't it? And if they play well together, four. Yeah, yeah, and it'll be and you know they've they've made that step up to full time, so they're going to be a, a committed side. They they've definitely got the sights on Super League. Um, I think Mullen's going to go well for them at, at full back as well. Um, yeah, I I I, re- I do want to see a successful Newcastle. We talk about the Super Super League teams that deserve Super League space. And Newcastle would be great for the game. So, this is as much as a realistic um, appraisal, but also a hopeful one for Newcastle being up there and competitive this year. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, the team that we have up next is a team that I love. It's the it's my hometown. We've got Halifax finishing. Uh, where do we put in third? We've put Halifax third on this one. But I just I think that's just because the team that. Them. They've just ah, oh, it. They're just the team has improved so much over the last two seasons, and last year was it shocked me. We finished third last year, I believe, and or second behind Fev, wherever we finished behind Fev last year, um, and Lee came. Lee have come down, and less Lee are better than us, but. I can't blame them for, for putting us third. We've brought so the players we've brought are un, we're just un, they're really really good players. You brought Brad Knowles in from Sheffield, and I've already mentioned Lachlan Wormsley and Louis Giffre from 
uh, Whitehaven. Joe Keyes comes in from Hull KR, the partner of Louis Jouffre, potentially in the halfback, but he's been given the number six shirt. Uh, Titus Guaze, Corey Aston, another quality halfback with super, the Super League calibre halfback that who can play the lower level. Joe Arundel was playing regularly for Wakefield. Matthew G, another one. Kyle Wood was playing regularly for Wakefield. Uh, and then you've got youngsters like Liam Witten and Cole Oakley who have come in. And then you look at the players that we still have. We've still got James Woodburn Hall, one of the players of the year for Halifax, probably for the last three or four seasons. Jacob Fairbank, Kevin Leroyer, Ed Barber, uh, Ben Tibbs, Adam, A Adam Tangatar, Elliot Morris, Brandon Moore, Dan Murray. Quality players in every single position. 26 men, and we'll probably make a couple of more loan signings as the year goes on, potentially. We always seem to do. If we can stay injury free, I think Scott Gricks and Simon Gricks and Liam Finn, who are leading the co who are the who are the coaching team behind this team, they have the, they have the knowledge and the just the, the skills in their head to lead this team to to another playoff finish. Um, I don't on, honestly, I don't think we go up this year. Um, I want us to win the championship. Obviously, um, my heart wants us to do it and everything else. But this Lee side that we put second and this Fed side we put first, yes, I've ruined it. We've got Featherstone Rovers finishing first and Lee St. Jude finishing second. But Halifax are probably the third best side in the championship. And if you two don't agree with me, please tell me. No, I to totally agree. I think this is a, a really strong side. Like you say, um, you, you hope that they stay fit and they, they carry over some of the success they saw last year. I, I think... Um, um, Gricks, the pair, the, the brothers now aren't they now yeah. the head coach and assistant coach Sam Gricks and Scott Gricks. I think I think they're fantastic. I think they're um, going to be able to get infuse this Halifax side to really really stick it to the top two teams this year. I've been sold the Halifax love story since we started this since we started chatting about rugby regularly uh, <laughs> last year. Um, I, you need a championship I, I, side, Toby. I'm you need old. a championship side. Come on. Talk. You talk about all those players, and there it is. It's players I've seen last season do something good in Super League. Um, little concerned at how much you you relied on Wakefield senior players, but no, it's um, only two. I, only what two. Think, what my favourite thing is is that the Panthers rebrand came, and it didn't just come as a let's try and sell more shirts to kids. It came as a we're now the Panthers, and we're now a top end Championship club. Yeah. And you know we're serious ab about about achieving promotion one day. Yeah, I think if it's not this year, it has to be next year. This is a team that's built, and slowly but surely, that you've got the players in. Players like Lachlan Wormsley, fingers crossed, we can keep him for a couple of seasons. If he has another year like he did last year, he'll be a Super League player next year. Uh, I think the same Lu uh, Louis Jouffre potentially could be a Super League player next year if he plays un unrealistically well. Like if he plays like world class rugby league, which like any of these players arguably belong in a Super League team potentially not like the likes of Woodburn Hall and everything else because we know how well they can play at the Championship and maybe that is just their level um, but Woodburn Hall potentially going to captain the team this year he's he struggled a bit towards, with injury towards the end of last year but he can play halfback fullback in a centre he's so versatile and he's so someone that we need to make sure stays injury free and we I think arguably we have a better a better chance of finishing second than Lee do, but overall Lee's squad's better, and they will, despite not being a team or a collective, the players that they bring in and they have brought in are probably just going to be a little bit too much to keep us out of the second position, I think. Yeah, I mean, I'd absolutely... I'd agree, uh, I think, Featherston and Lee... Uh, are the two clear? I think we had a bit of disagreement trying to place Featherston and Lee. Yeah. Um, but I do think that you know I, I I can't see a world where it's not those two for the what feels like tenth or fifteenth time we've seen those two at the top of uh, this championship. But yeah, I mean obviously I think there's that the underdog story that or undercat story I guess if you're Panthers that will come uh, that will come along with uh, Halifax. It's the is you know will affect my predictions for throughout this season. <laughs> um, hopefully, it affects them more than it affects mine. I think the reason we took Lee second, uh, Robin, was because you and me we prefer the Featherstone squad as a whole. 
and the fact that Lee only have 20 registered players according to to the to things we've seen. Yes, they've got Sam Stone, they've got Aaron Smith, Sid Lowe, Joe Wardle, Caleb Aiken, Tom Amone. Like they've got some really big name players, Mark Ioni, Ben Reynolds, Jai Hitchcock. You you name all these players and you're like, okay, this is a really good team. But they've only got 20 players. They're only going to be putting the same 21 man squad out on a Tuesday and in the nine the same potentially the same 19 man squad out on a Thursday, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. I, another one, uh, Nene McDonald as well from over from the NRL. So they they definitely um, have that ability. We were saying, you know, starting thirteen, then yeah, they they want they absolutely could beat Featherston, but it's the depth. Um, I think it's also, you know, they're coming down from Super League, they're falling, and it's kind of like where where will they, where are they going to be able to cling on to and and brace because. Um, it's a very different position to be coming from versus Featherston, who've just been building year on year. They nearly got there against Toronto. They nearly got there against London. Nearly got there against Toronto. They were there when um, against Toulouse. So it's just like they're just literally banging on the door of Super League every year, and they're still there. It's a very, very different position to be in compared to Lee, I think. Yeah, definitely. And the Fed team, you look at it and you think, this is this is ridiculously good. Luke Briscoe played quite a lot for Le- Leeds last year. Gareth Gale is probably one of the deadliest wingers in the championship. Joey Leilua from West Tigers. Yes, he was useless in the NRL and he's a liability. But he's th- he's a Super League player. He should be playing in the Super League, arguably. Uh, Craig Hall I mean, switches to centre. Dane Chisholm is pro- and Tom Holmes are probably one of the best halfback pair of partnerships in the league. And then you've just got their forward pack, which is... With with the with Brett Ferris in there, Jesse Senny Lefeo, uh, Junior Moore, Ben Hallow, uh, Ben Hallowell from London, it, Jake uh, Luke Cooper in there, Kyle Trapp. It's a quality, quality team, unreal. I mean, I think Featherstone have got the best back row in in the championship. Um, yeah. You look at the importance of the back row in some teams, especially like you look at the top in the NRL, and you look at the things like a Viliami Kakao or a. Um, Sikili uh, Supernova, you know, the things that they do. And I think that being able to use big, powerful second rows is huge in, um, in sort of dominant sides. And I think Sani Lafau, Brett Ferres, uh, to an extent, Junior Moores, if he's used in that role, mm. um, could provide there, is huge. Um, I mean, I personally still think that Lee have got. I mean, I, I do think that it's so close for me to the point where we talked we talk earlier about Caleb Aikens. Uh, players like Sam Stone, Aaron Smith, these are all players who I think either belong in the NRL or belong. Like Aaron Smith, I think, could easily play in the top four sides in Super League. Um, so there's an element, I mean, that might be a bit ambitious, maybe the second choice, things like that. Yeah. But there's something about that Leeds one which I like, but I, I, they're a smaller squad and they do not have the power that this Feds team possesses. No, yeah, and when you when you combine that forward pack that's going to lay a platform for Dane Chisholm, it's scary. It's scary for me as a York fan being in the same league as them yeah, because and, and quality Craig Ch- as Dane well. Chisholm could do exactly. And and with and in, in yeah. even you know Luke Briscoe, J- Joey Leilua, that that whole backline even um, probably the fullbacks the only the only weakness in there. J- Dane Chisholm's just going to be able to find gaps all over the place. It's gonna they're going to be a threatening side. They, I mean, you could you could make a case for that side in, at the bottom of Super League trying to avoid uh, relegation, in all fairness. Yeah, we, we spoke about it towards if those of you that watched us a bit last year and whatever. We spoke about how we we wouldn't want Fev in Super League because we don't want another small Yorkshire town being in there. But if a team is playing this well, you can't knock it, right? You can't knock the system. If they're based where they are, it doesn't matter where they are. If they're good enough, they're going to be good enough. And you said about the fullback being a weakness, but I don't think Bradford fans wanted Brandon, Pick- Brandon Pickersgill to leave the club. No, I, I'm I'm saying that purely based on when you look at the other four players in the back line. It's yeah. like when that's your weakness, then it's not an issue at all. No, it's definitely not an issue at all. And they've they've signed players that, like you said, Toby could protect that should be arguably NRL. Like Joey Leilua arguably could have been an NRL player still this season. Uh, Jesse Senna Lefeo had rumoured potentially he could be moving back. Um, Junior Moores has played in the NRL himself. Josh Hardcastle is a player that is potentially going to be snapped up 
by a Super League club if he plays really well in the centres this year. But I want to I want to kind of switch over our, uh, switch our focus right in a minute to. to I'm going to read through the table first. Actually, we're going to we we'll, we'll read through the table first. So, first Featherstone Rovers, second Lee Centurions, third Halifax Panthers, fourth Newcastle Thunder, fifth Batley Bulldogs, followed by Bradford Bulls in sixth, York City Knights rounding up the top half in seventh, uh, Whitehaven dropped to eighth uh, following the players that they've lost this season, but they finish above the Witness Vikings in ninth, Sheffield Eagles in tenth. Dewsbury Rams 11th with the London Broncos finishing as low as 12th and then unfortunately the two new sides to the division Barrow Raiders and Workington Workington Town 13th and 14th respectively um we'll come back to this at the end of the season obviously like we like we will with all of our leagues and see how accurate we are but I think we I think we could potentially be bang on here um there'll be a few teams that we won't get right but you know as a, as a collective we've done really really well um, I've noticed the time where this is going to be quite a long episode so hopefully you've got you're taking a bit of a shorter walk to work um, while you're listening to this on Friday morning or on the way home on, th- on Thursday evening if, if that's when you're listening but um, we need to move on we need to move on to the final uh, the, well not our final thing but one of the final things of the show and something that we'll talk about and we'll bring up every week it's Toby's section uh, it's it's your NRL watch not not the watch NRL it's the NRL watch. Yeah. Um, so nice and simple this week. Probably the biggest story in uh, in the NRL uh, throughout sort of last season. About this season was the fact that the Canterbury Branktown Bulldogs have decided to sign anyone who costs money, um, who costs a significant amount of money. Rather, uh, they have brought in a ridiculous amount of signings. They brought in eleven signings and let fifteen players go. Um, this includes Josh Adokar, one of Melbourne's top try scorers, Matt Burton, who I believe was a Dally M centre of the year, um, uh, but will probably be playing the halfbacks. You've got Brent Naden, part of that Penrith Panthers title winning team. Tavita Penga Jr., who was a huge signing in keeping Penrith ticking over towards the end of last season after he left the Broncos. Uh, and then they've just managed to supplement it with Max King and Isaac Lumilumi, both <laughs> Melbourne Storm players. Matt Dufty from the Dragons, who at the minimum's got incredible footwork and will be, dis- you know, will be finding try scoring room. Paul Vaughan, he's had a good he's career. Paul, he's Paul enough. Vaughan, yeah, he's Paul Vaughan. Yeah, it's Paul Vaughan. Um, but then on top of all that, and you must be sick of me at this point, but in their extended development squad, they have currently got Josh Ralph, and Josh Ralph is currently being eyed up as a potential like thirtieth man. For the Canterbury Branktown Bulldogs, so Wales is number one halfback. <laughs> Might well make his way into this 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 Bulldogs team. Really, do you think that under Trent is it Trent Barrett still the coach, isn't he? Yeah, um, I believe with David so. Fernie as the assistant. And do you think that the signings that are, that are being made and this complete overhaul of the club, spending all this money on effectively big names, uh, is it going to work out for the Bulldogs? Uh, no. I don't think it will. I think they've they, p- teams have done this before, where they've gone. Here's all the money. If we do win, it doesn't matter because we're going to get caught by the salary cap, and then it will be taken away. Um, that's how I see it. Anyway, I don't think this team is. I don't think this team's under the salary cap. So, if it is, show me. Show me how they fit under the salary cap. Um, it's if they do win like fair play they should win it with the players they've got they should be a playoff team they should be up there but after with one season together I don't think it's going to be enough quite frankly yeah I I, I, I agree what you I, I agree with what you're saying I think it's a short term solution to a problem which has plagued the Bulldogs for quite a number of years now um, I think they've I mean they have sat, they've they've made the best signings of the off season this year. So, on that fact, I would like to say that they would be the most improved as well. Which, you know, when you start at the bottom, is easy to do. But I yeah. think I think they've I think they've signed well. I think they've signed well across the team as well. They they've, they've kind of um have, have picked up backs and forwards. They haven't just sort of got 
you don't like we've seen West Tigers just pick up loads of like wingers and centers that they don't need. Like they've they've been they they're pretty smart in the signings. Um I, I don't know. It's it's difficult to call when you get so many new players, there's just so many variables. Mm. It, it, like you say, we've seen it before where teams just like switch on and then the salary cap catches them. We've seen when teams sign loads of players and they just can't gel properly. Um I don't know. It's it's difficult to call. It's definitely it's going to be interesting to watch. And um, I mean, per- personally, I, I like to see him do better. I think I I, I like an underdog, um, and so I want to see them do better than they did last year. Uh, hopefully, they won't get caught by the salary cap. Hopefully, it's all above board, and we won't have any more um, controversies to talk about. But yeah, it, it's definitely interesting. I, I think one one thing that's um, kind of a bit weird is. Uh, we were talking last week about the players that are signed for 2023 and how it makes you really confusing, like who's playing where, and it mm. makes you question the, the players' um, loyalty. But I think in this case, it's definitely worked in the Bulldogs' favour because all all of last year, we were talking about Bulldogs 2022. They, you know, they, were, they drew yeah. so much attention to themselves. So in a way, they, they've kind of um, definitely capitalised on the ability to, to talk about themselves, build themselves up and get a, a, a load of press. Yeah, I don't know if that puts the pressure on them or takes the pressure off them, the fact that people are talking about the players that they've signed. Obviously, they've got arguably one of the best props in the world there as well in Luke Thompson. Um, you were talking about the, the extended squad and they've got Josh Ralph in there at, at half-back at, at Toby, but they've also got Stephen Lamasters and um, Isaac Lumi-Louis who, played, who have played... Um, uh, quite a bit. Well, not quite a bit, but he, both players have played six NRL games. Uh, I think they both played six NRL games last season for, for Melbourne and South Sydney, respectively. So the the fact that those two players drop out into an extended squad and they had to release Lachlan, Lachlan Lewis towards the end of the year as well. They've released Sione Katoa um, and they've released Dean Britt as well. So three players released and two and three players that should be potentially in their, in their full team. That that's that's a that's a big big squad. I don't think I don't think injuries will potentially be a problem for them this year, do you? I doubt it. I go. My concern I have with them is that there's not a you know they spent a lot of money on a lot of players, but they haven't improved hooker. They haven't improved loose forward. They haven't improved scrum half, and they've arguably improved fullback. But also, if Josh if Josh Adokar plays fullback and plays really well, I guess they've. You know that's that's um, that's one thing, but I want those are the positions you want the, your stars to be in. And Matt Burton aside, the spine I think hasn't been addressed necessarily with stars first. Um, and I think there could still be a struggling linking together effectively now a team of players who have Star gone to the Bulldogs because the Bulldogs have money. Yeah. Um. You say you say you don't think they've improved at fullback. Uh, Matt Duffy's in there. Um. Obviously signed from St George and. He's electric, and on his day, he is unplayable. But he is obviously very, very inconsistent. Hooker-wise, um, Bailey Biondi Odo, last year you were raving about him. Um, he'll probably play behind Jeremy Marshall King in, in uh, as the as the ball player. Do you think? Do you think they need to improve at hooker, or do you think Biondi Odo, or however you say, it, playing behind Jeremy Marshall King will be enough? I just, for me, it's just that it's that idea of pumping the money into into the non-spine positions when your spine isn't set in stone yet. Obviously, I want to be wrong, and I, I was really... I can't remember where it is, but I was going really excited by Bailey Beyond the Oddo. Um, and I think it is something where I hope that he's got it in him to start every week or to play every week, it, things like this. But there's just that concern that if, you know, if a hooker isn't of the highest quality, then how you know why have I got so many players around him who he's not going to be able to effectively use? Um, but obviously, I'm hoping to be wrong. I just think that when I look, I look down the spine of a team, and I don't, I, I don't see expensive spine necessarily, which is where I'd want the money to be spent if I was an NRL owner. Yeah, no, I hundred percent agree with you there. Um, we obviously we love to to segue our NRL watch into into something, and we did last week. Um, a player that Canterbury potentially could have tried to go for to improve their, their half-backs is, is Mitch Pearce. Do you think he would have been even 
you think they would have approached him or do you think he would have been on way too much money and he definitely wouldn't have fit under a salary cap for them? Probably the salary cap is probably the issue. I, I think that they've, they've, they've got to be maxing out to bring in all these players. So um, I think that I think Toby's right. I think they've maybe put all their eggs in the basket of we're going to develop some player. We've got some youngster coming through who's going to be able to fill those positions. They're not in the position to be looking for a, an established halfback like Mitch Pierce. No, they need to. They need another Sonny Bill, but a halfback version of Sonny Bill, don't they? Really, to sort yeah. of, to sort of maybe really, really improve them uh, in that in that aspect of things. But we are getting on a bit. We're now an hour and a half in, and we we are going to get there. We're going to do it. We're going to go to our set of six. But this week we're kicking early. We're kicking on four this week. We're going to surprise the opposition. Um, we were we were having an hour in about whether to include a, a predictions this week, but we will need to. Um and before we go into the games this week, we we're all level after week one. We're all level. Um, four from four. Everyone's four from four. So congratulations, lads. Very very well done indeed. Uh, to, to, uh, Robin, you and me got the game wrong at uh, Tatterheath versus Lock Lane, which was a little bit disappointing. Um, we all got um one of the other games. We all got the army right. We all got the charges right, uh, which was quite nice to see as well. But we all seem to get, and then each of us got one wrong as well to, to, throughout, which is so thing. I picked Edinburgh over York, which was obviously a mistake. I think you two both went for York on the, on that one. So tight, really tight. After six six points available, all on four points. So get in there. Only another 43 rounds to go. <laughs> Um, and this week we're not. This week there's only four points on offer, um, and we'll go with um, we'll go with game number one on this one. Actually, no, we can't go to game number one yet. You need to do your badge rating, Toby. Um, last week you rated the um, which team was it again? That you rated a York seven point five. Uh, York Acorn yeah. was a seven point five out of ten. Uh, this week though, you've got the uh, the Carsacon badge to, to rate. It's in the chat. And it's up on screen for, for those of you that are watching. Unfortunately, those listeners on Spotify, I'm sorry, you can't see it. Um, I'll put it in the uh, in the thing, in the little photo at the start. But give us your intake on, on this badge quickly. Give us a little rating out of 10 as well. Yeah, well, assuming I'm seeing the right one, because I, I, I found it online, it's, uh, you know. I put it in the chat. I put it in, I put it, oh, no, uh, yeah, I put it in the chat, in the, in the chat. It just hasn't come through for me, so oh. there we go. But yeah, is it the one with the big yellow? Oh, it's coming through now. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay, good job. Yeah. Did that because the one I was looking at was a big yellow C, and it was about <laughs> to. So anyway, um, oh, so the carcass on badge. They've made very clear what their name is. They've got a bit of a, a castle structure going behind, which is something I was quite a fan of on the uh, York Acorn badge. Um, so you know, I feel like they're going sort of neck and neck. Uh, I like the use of the colour yellow. I feel, it, you know, it, I like when a team doesn't just go for blue or red. Um, I've got to be honest, the imagery just isn't at the standard that you know, we saw from York Acorn. Um, although it's a very clean badge and there's a lot less going on. Uh, I think, for me though, there's got to be something on there which is just an image I like to look at. This is just a badge I can sort of appreciate. So I think this is a 7. So it's just below the York Acorn it's badge? below York Acorn, because okay. it was kind of messy but with fun images. Versus nice, clean, but not as image heavy. That's fine. I'll make sure we add that to our little our little league table, and um, next week I'll make sure there's a graphic available for the for the league table once we put um, our, our third team on there as well. But we need to get on. We need to do our set of six. Um, game one, Lesignon versus Albi Tigers. Um, I'm going to go Lesignon. I think they haven't lost a game all season. They've got the unbelievable players. That they've signed from Super League, um, and it's it's James Maloney, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I I'm not gonna lie, I'm I'm not a, a an expert on on the French Elite One, but I know James Maloney, and so for that reason, any any game that you ask me to predict involving Lesignon, I'm gonna pick him. Yeah, the Lesignon for League One campaign, I think, is something that we need to be serious about uh, before James Maloney retires from rugby, <laughs> or, rugby league altogether. Um, they've haven't, they haven't lost a game this season, if the scores I'm reading are correct. 
Um, and Monmo James were only training with like Call of Duty, so it's letting on. Um, yeah, a clean sweep there for, for Lezignon. So please don't lose your first game of the season to Albi Tigers, who've, <laughs> lost, who've lost their last five and only won since the first game of the season. Um, I don't know how to say this name. Um, Son Gordon Vers versus uh, St. Estes Catalan is game number two. Who wants to take so this one? this is this is the um, the Catalan sort of reserve team. Is that it is, is that yeah, correct? That is correct. Yeah. yeah. So um, obviously we're going to be expecting them to be reasonably competitive because um, they've all got the potential to be called up into the Super League squad. Um, just looking at the table, I can also see that St. Gordon's there. Uh, without a win so <laughs> I'm back in the the Catalan backup team uh, yeah I've gone with them as well um, you can't knock the a, a reserve Super League team really can you against a team that hasn't won all season yeah St Gordon's have won four French Rugby League championships 69-70 73-74 1991 and 2003-2004 which is more championships than Catalan more, more championships than Catalan Dragons have won as a Super League club, but <laughs> I don't think that matters too much. <laughs> maybe for I'll the fans. To, maybe for I was the fans. I yeah. to use that to go for St. Gordon's, but I think it's one. I just I, you're not going to bet on a no win team um, this early in the season um, until they prove us wrong. So yeah, St. Estevé, uh, I I I dragons. <laughs> nice. Uh, once again, we all pick the same team. <laughs> We have another sort of Super League reserve side up next in the Toulouse Olympique Broncos. Um, they're playing uh, Avignon. 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 Who, um, I'm not looking at this. I'm just picking Toulouse. I'm picking on the, the French teams that I know and I see and I read about. I'm just picking those. Uh, I'm going to lose. I thought we're supposed to pick who's going to win, not who's to lose. <laughs> oh. oh, that's <laughs> awful. <laughs> That's oh, awful. If you don't pick Avignon now, then you just ruined your own joke. No, I know. I've got. I mean, <laughs> table's talking again. I hate picking with the table, but I, I'm going with Avignon, and it makes me sort of happy to do it knowing that you've picked a lead. So, yeah. yeah, I'm not. I'm yeah. kind of letting this one go a little bit. <laughs> I think uh, this early on in the year, I've just got to take it seriously and, and go off the table as well. So I'll be I'll be going with Avignon as well. Nice. I'm glad you two have gone different for me, and I can't wait to take a little bit of a lead. Um, next up, <laughs> uh, Villeneuve versus uh, Limoux. I'm not looking at the league table. Um, who's who's above them? Who's above who? Uh, the, the the team beginning with L. Limoux. Limoux. Are they above them? Limoux. Limoux. Uh, Limoux. They've five. They've oh, five wins. In that Limoux. case, in that case, then I'm going with them. Oh. <laughs> I don't know these teams really. I don't know the players that play for these teams, so this is a, this is a bit of a fun week. So I'm picking the Villeneuve Leopards because I don't think there's enough leopard branded sports teams in. Uh, in Do they play in leopard spots? They, I think I hope if they don't, they then it's an embarrassment. I think. Uh, apparently, according to Wikipedia, they play in green and white, but well, that doesn't make any sense. Ooh, they're That's not very it. leopard like, are they? They're playing green yeah. and white. Look, Ooh. I will, if Villeneuve, you know, the Villeneuve Leopards start playing in the leopard print, I will buy one of those shirts and wait for every podcast for God knows how long. Okay, well, I, will, I think you suit leopard print. Yeah, I think you would suit leopard print. It'd go really well with the Welsh flag behind you. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, go on, Robin. You, it's your turn to pick. I've gone with so, the, the Toby's gone for the leopards. Yeah, I'm. I'm not going for the green and white leprechauns. I'm going for uh, <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, this is going to be fun. Um, so we'll all be something out of ten next week. So we'll have a bit of a percentage to give you all um, on next week. But um, thank you very much for joining us. Next week, then we will talk Challenge Cup second round. We will go really in depth into individual ties. We'll pick our standout ties of the round. There won't be a player of the round um, next week because we won't be able to watch any of the games and see any games. So there won't be a player of the round next week. I'll pick my. Um, inductee or inductees or induct or something into the Hall of Fame uh, and once again um, 
we'll bring you the biff on a Thursday evening. So I've been Bradley. That's been Robin. That's been Toby. I'm pointing at them. So sorry, listeners. Um, and we'll see you next week for episode three of the Biff. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. See you later. Thank you.